The grace and mercy of our Lord be with you as you are watching today. I welcome you and thank the Lord for sustaining us all amidst this pandemic. To aid us in our meditation this morning, allow me to lead you to Philippians chapter 2 and we'll be reading from verse 5 to 11. In Philippians, the Apostle Paul writes, Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of man, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Our Lord God is worthy and deserving of all our praises and honor. He alone should be exalted by every tongue. And remembering His sacrifice on the cross and His continuing work in us, we should declare that to Him alone be all the glory. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we worship You and exalt You, Lord. And we open our hearts to you, for you alone are worthy, and you alone are deserving of all our praise. Lord, this morning we ask that you might free us from whatever blinds us from seeing your glory and your majesty as we humble ourselves. Lord, as we listen to your message and hear from your word, speak to each and every one, that we may see you and revere you. All this we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Stand before the
Let's all continue in the spirit of worship and praise to our loving and gracious Heavenly Father as we humble ourselves before Him in prayer. Let's join our faiths together in His presence. Dear Father, we bless and thank you for your faithfulness in the week that passed. And we look on with faith to you in this new week that you have given us. We thank you for another opportunity to know you more and learn of your wonderful ways for us through Christ by the workings of the power of your grace through the Holy Spirit. Father, bless us again with deeper insights from your truth that our life might be faithful and fruitful for your glory amidst the challenges of the crisis we are growing through. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. My message today is entitled by a question to us all. And the question is, am I contented? Regarding contentment, let me share an incident with a factory owner who was making rounds of his work area one day and he overheard a conversation between two of his employees regarding contentment. One said to the other, you know, I will be contented if only I had 5,000 pesos in my pocket right now. After the work hours, the employer invited this worker into his office hoping he could teach his valued employee a lesson on contentment. He said, You know, I was going around the work area this morning and as I came around near your section, I overheard you say to your co-worker that, You know, I will be contented if only I had something right now. I failed to hear what your particular item is that you said that would make you contented because of the noise of our factory machines. Can you tell me what that particular item was that you said? The employee smiled and replied, It's nothing, sir. Me and the other person were just having conversations. The owner insisted, no, no, I really wanted to know what that specific item will make you contented. To which the employee quickly replied, if you insist, sir, I said during that time, if only I had 5,000 pesos. The item you missed, sir, is 5,000 pesos in my pocket. Upon hearing the amount, the owner took out 5,000 pesos from his drawer and gave it to the worker and said, here is 5,000 and let me clarify that this is not a cash advance, so don't worry, it will not be deducted to your salary this month. You may go now. The employee, taken aback by the surprise, thanked the employer. As he was getting out of the office, the owner said to him, watch out for yourself, especially watch out for your heart. The last statement felt strange to the employer, but, I mean to the employee, but he did not give it much thought because his mind was on the significant amount of cash already in his pocket. But as he went out of the gate of the factory, this worker suddenly felt a sense of dissatisfaction. As he said to himself in regret, why did I say 5,000 pesos? I should have said 
10,000 pesos. And he went on his way with a discontented heart. Someone observed that there are two groups of people in the world who live in tents. He pointed out that the one group are those who are content and the other group are those who live in discontent. Now, what do you think? Which group do you belong? Now, don't misunderstand me. If you say I belong to those who are discontent, we will not give you 5,000 pesos at the end of this service because, because simply we are not financially in the position to do so. If only we can, if only we can. However, we all can learn from the Bible regarding contentment so that our lives might always be in tune with His redemptive purposes in spite of the difficulties and the challenges and the uncertainties we are experiencing so that our lives might always be for His use and for His glory and praise in Christ Jesus. Amen? Now, for an historical background, the church in Philippi contributed more financially and emotionally to Paul's ministry than all the churches he had founded or known. When Paul was in affliction, they shared or fellowship in his sufferings. And we will see that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 14. Sending Epaphroditus with a gift in verse 18, to take care of the needs of uh, the imprisoned Paul. And we see that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Even in the early days of Paul's ministry in the region of Macedonia, not one of the churches except the church in Philippi shared with him. And when Paul was in Thessalonica, the Philippians sent him help again And again, when he was in need. And we see this in Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 to 16. While Paul's need was supplied by the Philippian church, his response was to share with them a key to his strength. And what is that? His contentment. And so, What is contentment, brothers and sisters? How do I know if I have contentment? And what is the secret to contentment? In answer to these questions, let's read our passage first. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 to 13, it says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lack opportunity. Not that I speak from one, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in any And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in continuing to answer those questions we asked earlier, let me present to you our first major point from this passage we just read. The first is contentment is an attitude to learn. And we find this in verses 11 to 12. Once again, let me just read for you. It says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and in every circumstance, 
I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Now, here, contentment is something that we were not born with. Let me say that, brothers and sisters. We have natural tendencies and attitudes that we were born with. That's true. But according to our passage, contentment is an acquired attitude. It is something we need to learn by experience until they are formed as an attitude. Genuine Christianity is not just, it is not just a hearing religion. It is also a learning religion. And for me, attitude, okay, Attitude is the direction or the way our thoughts and our hearts are inclined to. It could be the tendencies where we allow our minds and our emotions to dwell, which eventually dictates on our thinking patterns and our behaviors. It is dictated and influenced by our belief, feelings, and we usually manifest them towards persons, group, things, and situations. The original word for content is autarkes. It is a compound word from autos, which means self, and archeo, which means sufficient. And literally, it means being self-sufficient and competent. The implication for us is true contentment can be acquired only by the help of the Holy Spirit. Outer kes, the Greek word, therefore describes the man who is not dependent and easily disturbed within because his focus and reliance is on God for all his or her needs. And let me point out the words of someone that I read. And he said, Let your riches consist not in the largeness of your possessions, but in the fewness of your wants. Contentment does not depend on what we have. It depends on who we are. It is a spiritual attainment, not something that results from purchasing power. As someone has said, and I quote, Contentment is a state of heart rather than a statement of account. I think it was Theodore Epp who spoke that. Godly contentment as an inclination and a tendency of the mind and the heart that is learned and formed by the help of the Holy Spirit. That's why Galatians 5, 22 to 23 tells us, allow me to read for you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And that means contentment is the outcome of those virtues coming from the Holy Spirit. Now, what did the Apostle Paul learn that has become his attitude of contentment? First, let me point out, he learned God's sovereignty through Christ. It is significant to observe that the Apostle Paul, who was an itinerant preacher, is now under house arrest and being guarded day and night, restricted from reaching out to the regions beyond. He nevertheless writes an encouraging letter with a tone of rejoicing. Philippians was the most triumphant of all his letters. 
Eleven times in this letter, the apostle uses the word rejoice, marking the theme of the letter. And the reason he can rejoice in such distressing circumstances is that he has learned the key to rejoicing in all circumstances. That is the sovereignty of God. The Apostle Paul has learned to live above his circumstances by realizing the truth that scriptures of his time states. And what is that? God is sovereign. For us to see the details of what the Apostle Paul learned about the sovereignty of God, let me bring you to a verse that speaks of God's sovereignty in another letter written by the Apostle Paul around the same time and place when he wrote Philippians. Allow me to show you Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. It says here, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. It tells us that our sovereign God in Christ has blessed us with an inheritance. Now, in the Greek, Inheritance is kleruo, which means that we believers in Christ became appointed heirs of God because He predestined us according to His purpose. The inheritance Paul is pointing out here is not material wealth, ease, and comfort. The inheritance in Christ is God's fixed purpose in proportion to the wisdom and loving discretion of His will. In other words, it is not by chance nor by our best efforts that determines the destiny of believers in Christ, that determines our destiny, but it is the predetermined wisdom and graciousness of our sovereign God, which eventually leads to Romans 8, 28 and 29, which says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And this is what the apostle had discovered. You know, I am reminded regarding this of the story of Jacob de Shazar. I found this story while preparing this message. The twist and turns in the life of Jacob de Shazar sound like the plot of an intriguing war novel. But Taken together, they show us the mysterious ways in which God moves. Deshazar served the U.S. Army Air Corps in World War II as a bombardier in the squadron of General Doolittle. Now, if you know Doolittle, he was the one who planned the bombing of Japan. And... While participating in Doolittle's raid on Japan in 1942, Deshazar and his crew ran out of fuel and they bailed out over China. And he was taken to a Japanese prison camp where he trusted Jesus as Savior in that prison camp. After his release, he became a missionary to Japan. One day, Deshazar handed a track with his story in it to a man named Mitsuo Fushida. 
And he didn't know that Mitsuo was on his way to a trial for his wartime role as the commander of the Japanese forces that attacked for Pearl Harbor. Fujita read the pamphlet and got a Bible. He soon became a Christian and an evangelist to his people in Japan. Eventually, Deshazar and Fujida met again and became friends. It's amazing how God can take two men who were mortal enemies, bring them together, and lead them to himself. But my point is, it shows us that God is in control and nothing, not even a world war can stop God from working all things according to the counsel of His will. What did the Apostle Paul learn that has become his attitude of contentment in this first major point? Well, the next, he learned God's sufficiency in Christ. Note in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, through him who strengthens me. The Apostle Paul tells us in verse 13 that he had learned and gained strength from the sufficiency of Christ. The literal rendering in Philippians 4.13 is, I can do all things in him who continually infuses me with strength. That's the literal rendering. The Lord Jesus Christ is the indwelling life within us who is fully sufficient and able to meet every circumstance that may come our way. Contentment is learned from knowing and living out the life of Christ in us. When we start knowing Christ intimately and experiencing His indwelling reality, His abiding presence through whatever circumstances, then we will find life begins to change and the whole of our attitude, our articulations or our words, and even our action begins to alter or begins to change. This basic wisdom and value in times of hardship, of trial, in times of suffering and difficulties, and the times of blessings, joy and gladness are not drawn from these bad and good experiences, but they are derived from God and His character, His wisdom, His purposes, through the indwelling Christ in us. It is not the problems, it is not the difficulty that provides us this transformation, that brings about this transformation. But it is as we continue to behold the glory of God in Christ, we are changed from glory to glory. Brothers and sisters, the old sufficient indwelling Christ was Paul's source of strength and contentment. Christ is always present with us so we can depend on Him whatever the situation may be. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have abundance for every good deed. And here in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, Paul is saying that because of his living relationship of union with the living, all-sufficient Christ, 
he can do whatever the Lord calls him to do for his kingdom. Philippians 4.13 then affirms the sufficiency of Christ for the believer's every need. But this truth today is being assailed. It is being undermined by the Christian psychologist, or at least, quote-unquote, Christian psychology movement, which claims that Christ is sufficient but for our spiritual needs only and not for our other needs, most especially our emotional needs. But once again, let me bring back to you Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that asserts the list of the fruit of the Spirit that describes the qualities of the person submitted and walking in the Spirit. Did you hear me? In Galatians 5.22, it describes the qualities that comes about in a person when that person is truly submitted and walking in submission to the Holy Spirit. Once again, Galatians 5.22, it says to us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self control and the others it describes to us the picture of an emotionally stable christian the living christ and his word are powerful to strengthen you to serve him which includes emotional well-being Whatever our inner needs may be, learn to trust daily in the sufficient Savior and you will know His contentment in your soul. Do not insist with what you want or what we think or what we feel. Let's not insist on that. Let us submit to the Holy Spirit, to God the Holy Spirit in us. That's why Galatians 5.16 says, Walk in the Spirit so you do not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And the desires of the flesh will always pull us down. You know, for an illustration, a story of a wealthy merchant during Paul's day had heard about the Apostle Paul and had become so fascinated that he determined to visit him. So when passing through Rome, he got in touch with Timothy, according to the story, and arranged an audience with the Apostle Paul, who was under house arrest. Entering his detention cell, the merchant was surprised to find the apostle looking rather old and physically frail. But, but he felt at once the strength, the serenity, and the magnetism of this man who relied on Christ as his all in all. They talked for some time and finally, the merchant left. Outside the cell, he asked Timothy, what's the secret of this man's power? I've never seen anything like it before. And Timothy replied, did you not guess? Paul is in love. And the merchant looked puzzled at that reply from Timothy. In love, he asked. Yes, said Timothy. Paul is in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the merchant looked even more bewildered and said, is that all? And Timothy, according to this legend, just smiled and replied, that is 
everything, sir. That is everything. These truths, brothers and sisters, are life-changing if we take it to mind and to heart. If we lay hold of them and live in the light of them, as Ray Steadman exhorts us to do, and I quote, he said, the question, the reader then is, are you enjoying your inheritance? Do you wake up in the morning and remind yourself at the beginning of the day that I am a child of the Father? I have been chosen by Him to be a member of His family. Stedman tells us, God imparts to us all the richness of this life. His peace, His joy, His love are our legacy, our inheritance from which we can draw every moment of life and have them no matter what our outward circumstances may be. Do you reckon on these unseen things which are real and true? Stedman asked. Because if you do, he says, when you trust in God's grace to be your present experience, you can know of yourself what the Father said. Three times about his son, Jesus. God the Father, looking down at you, can say, this fellow here, this lady there, this man, this woman, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. That is our inheritance. And quote. Now, going back to our main question, what is contentment? How do I know if I have contentment? What is the secret to contentment? My next answer, a second major point in this message is contentment is an ability to live. Did you hear me? Contentment is the ability to live. And in verse 11 to 12, the apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit gives us a description of the ability brought about by his contentment. Listen as I read for you verse 12. He says, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. The English phrase, I know, is just one word in the original Greek. That's the word oida. Literally, it means coming to full realization. And the Apostle Paul is saying that he now has the ability to be able to live with contentment coming from a much fuller realization and being helped by the Holy Spirit. Paul now has solid grasp and full conviction how to live his life effectively amidst good and bad circumstances. Oida, or the English phrase I know, describes fullness of knowledge compared to knowledge still in progress, which is the Greek word ginosko. This clear distinction is illustrated in John chapter 8, verse 55. There, Jesus said, and I quote for you, You have not come to know, that's Ginosko, the first no. You have not come to know him, but I know, and that's the second no, which is now Oida. 
Jesus used ginosko first, and then in the second word, no, he uses the word oida, translated as oida. Or in other words, here Jesus says in essence, I know God fully. That is what God is pointing out to us through the Apostle Paul. First, contentment is ability. Ability for what? It is ability to accept the challenges God arranges for our situations. And that leads us to verse 11, where it says to us here, Philippians 4.11, it says, Not that I speak from want, and the word want there, in the New American Standard, is translated as need in the ESV and in the NIV. And as I continue in verse 11, the Apostle Paul tells us, For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in any And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Now, the word want in the NASB and the word need in the ESV and the NIV in verse 11 is the Greek hostereo. It describes the condition of Lacking the essentials. It is very obvious in the context because Paul was under detention and was likely given only the bare minimum of what he needs, such as food, drink, clothes, and a place to sleep. We cannot imagine a place of comfort of style and privilege, of preferred companions. There was none of that with the Apostle Paul in his detention. He cannot choose who his companions would be, whom he would be comfortable with, like family and close friends. So what he is saying is something I would paraphrase like this. Although I am in a situation of need and lack the pleasures of some things, but I wrote to you about my gratefulness to the Lord because you revive your concern for me through the gift you sent. That's how I would paraphrase his words. And continuing, there is more of this paraphrase of mine. But please don't think that I am coming from a motive of want. Please don't think I am hinting something to you so you can send more and be more consistent in supporting me. That's not where I am coming from because as the Apostle Paul says, I have learned contentment. I now have the ability to accept and make do with whatever the Lord wills regarding my present circumstances. Brothers and sisters, I believe that is what the Apostle Paul was trying to point out to them. Paul in this letter was with intent of encouraging them and sharing to them principles that would develop their faith in Christ. And let me add, contentment, comes into our minds and hearts when we begin to recognize and accept that situation and positions that God placed us at a particular time. When we begin to accept those positions and situations, and then we begin to trust Him amidst the uncomfortable, difficult, and even painful circumstances because He is always committed to our spiritual growth and transformation into Christ-likeness. Paul says, 
I have found a secret and the secret is this. No matter what state I face in life, I can experience inner satisfaction of heart. I can have this inner satisfaction knowing that whatever I am facing in life is from God and the events associated with my life are moving according to His plan and will. Brothers and sisters, let me point out to you how our health is doing will not make us content in life. How our job is going will not make us content in life. How your car is running will not make you content in life. How much money we have in the bank will not make us content in life. Do you know why? It's because contentment is not based on any material thing, on money and health and cars, or any outward circumstances. Contentment is not based on those. You could have all of those and still be discontented. Do you understand me? Because contentment is based upon faith in God and knowing God's sovereignty and providence in our life. The secret for contentment in every situation is to focus on the Lord as the sovereign, as Savior, and as the sufficient one. He is the sovereign one to whom I must submit. He is the Savior whom I must serve. He is, He is the one whom I must trust. If I know Him in these ways and on these terms as Paul did, I will know contentment. Brothers and sisters, you will know contentment. Paul was confident that he was in the will of God, living his life under the providence of God. He knew that wherever he was or in whatever circumstances he found himself, he was there by divine appointment. Did you hear me? He was there. He knew that, that it was divine appointment. In other words, he is saying if he was hungry, it was because God wants him to be hungry. If he was full, it was because his Lord had so planned it for him to be full. As Paul busily and faithfully engaged in the service of his king, he could say with confidence, as Jesus said, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. That's Matthew eleven twenty six. 26. Life is not a series of accidents. It is a series of appointments, brothers and sisters. That's life for the believer in Christ. The providence of God is the source of our contentment. Paul discovered this early on in his Christian life. God's providence means that His hands is ruling and overruling in the affairs of our lives. You know, Joseph in Egypt said to his guilt-stricken brothers in Genesis 50:20, "As for you," he said, "you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it." For good, in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive, thereby intimating to them the sovereignty and the providence of God that made him forgiving and generous rather than worry and vengeful. And this is the providence of God. It is God working out His plan for our lives in spite of the seemingly bad situation that we face. Paul realized that faith in the providence of God's workings caused him to find 
inner contentment and satisfaction of heart in spite of all the changes that he had to face in life. And regarding this, the Scottish Reformed theologian Sinclair Ferguson said, and I quote for you, contentment is the direct fruit of having no higher ambition than to belong to the Lord at his disposal, end quote. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delight in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Contentment is firmly rooted in a steadfast faith in the providence of God, trusting that whatever happens in my life is filtered through the omnipotent, omniscient, loving fingers of my Father. Contentment is the ability to adjust in the conditions God allows in our situation. Once again, look at this second sub-point here in our second major point. Contentment is ability to adjust in the conditions God allows in our situations. And let me read to you verse 11 and 12 once again. He says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity in any and in every circumstance. I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. So far, we have covered verse 11 and the first half of verse 12 in this last point before I close. Let me direct your attention to the second half of verse 12. And the Apostle Paul tells us here that his ability in life amidst whatever the prevailing outward circumstances was because he learned the secret. It was because he learned the secret. The Greek for learned the secret is just one word. And that word is mueo. This is the common term used to describe initiation rites. Let me note for you that the usual word for secret is kryptos or cryptic, meaning hard to discover. Mueo is pointing us to an initiation process for the specific purpose. Listen to me. For the specific purpose of teaching and development of ability. It is not making hard for us to understand. That's the difference between kryptos or cryptic and mueo that was used here. That's why Paul says, I have learned. It could be learned. And the ability could be developed as God initiates us into certain rights through circumstances and situations. That's the point, brethren. God speaks to us through the Apostle Paul in the second half of verse 12 saying that he had initiated his servant Paul into the lessons taught by adversity and by prosperity. Note the contrasting situations God used so we can learn to adjust to any and every circumstances are specified here in verse 12. The first is with humble means, followed by to be able to live in prosperity. Then 
the condition or circumstance of being filled contrasted with going hungry. And then follows the situation of having abundance and suffering need. God does this to us believers in Christ to teach us the ability and the flexibility to adjust to any situation so we can continue to live like Christ and live for Christ to the glory of God the Father. That is why for those committed to Christ, the good days and the bad days in life are not just random incidents, but they are divine appointments to develop in us the ability to live life for the glory of God. As I close, let me share with you one of the many personal experiences God used to teach me Christ and the inner ability to live life with contentment. Several sermons ago, I shared with you my experience early on in ministry when we were sent to a remote town in, Eastern, in the Eastern Visayan province of Samar. After a month of what we felt were daily deprivation and sacrifice because the place where we went to was deprived of many modern comforts and conveniences. We, use, we were used to in the big city. After a month, which seemed like a year for us, we were finally homebound, ready to get back to the big city with all of its amenities. Some grateful brethren prepared a lunch party the day before our departure. And we were told that we will be taken to a very small island, just two kilometers from the beach, fronting the vast Pacific Ocean. And they took us by small boats there early in the morning. The brother that brought us there was a local fisherman. And when we saw his footwear, we tried our best to hold back our laughter so as not to embarrass him. But... But we could not. Why? Because when we saw his pair of high-cut basketball shoes, which was a cheap brand, but with cut-out toes. Okay? Can you imagine that? With cut-out toes and cut-out part of the ankle of the shoes. We cannot stop ourselves but to laugh. And, you know, why? Because you know, compared to our imported and top brand sneakers, it really provoked our laughter, much to our embarrassment as ministers of God. We had a nice time over lunch and we had to walk back to the beach because the water had receded to below a foot. The same brother was assigned to walk us back, advised that it would be better for us, we would be better off if we walk barefoot on the sand. At first, we were suspicious that he might just be envious of our superior footwear. So we did not take his advice. Now, while wading in the shallow water, we had to stop several times to take out the few grain of sand that was getting into our shoes. It was painful and um, unbearable, and after several meters walking, we noticed we were lagging behind this brother who stopped and looked back at us as he shakes his feet in the water to take out the sand from his shoes. No wonder it was cut in the front and it was cut at the back so that he could easily dispel the grain of sand from his shoes. Back at the beach, 
this brother showed great sympathy. He was very sympathetic when he saw us in pain and with our blistered feet. At that point, God spoke to my heart with spiritual insight. He taught me that the issues that truly matter in life is not how bad or how good our circumstances may be or how prosperous or deprived we are with the things of this life. The most important issue is Do we have the wisdom and the ability to accept and adjust to any and every circumstances in life according to God's will and according to God's way for us? Do we have that ability so that we can be faithful and fruitful for His purposes in Christ for His glory? Now, going back to our questions, am I contented? What is contentment? How do I know if I have contentment? What is the secret to contentment? The person who is truly contented in life is not the person who has all that he wants and possesses all that he could ever dream of having. But the person who is truly contented is the person whose attitude in this life is being shaped by who God is in Christ and is developing the ability to accept and adjust to any and every circumstances according to God's will. In conclusion, so the contented person is a person who can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Before we pray, let me turn to those of you who are listening right now. And if God is speaking in your heart, let me ask you, have you committed your life to Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you done that? If you will be honest with yourself, have you really committed your life to Christ to make Him as your Savior and Lord of your life? If not, let me invite you. I won't tire inviting people to surrender to Christ and recognize Him as Lord and Savior. And I invite you right now, if you have not done that ever before, do that right now. Do you believe, answer these questions, do you believe that you are a sinner? Okay. Second, if you say yes to that question, do you believe that you cannot save yourself by your own effort and good works? If your answer again is yes, then my final question is, do you believe Jesus died for you? for your salvation, for your eternal life. If you say yes to that also, then pray with me to receive Christ. Would you do that right now? Let's pray. Let's pray to all who are listening and to those of you out there who are listening to this message, particularly this invitation. Pray with me. Pray from your heart. I will lead in prayer. Make it a prayer of your own, from your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and bless you, O Lord. Lord, I confess I am a sinner and I cannot save myself by my own goodness and my own effort. Lord, I ask forgiveness for my sins, O God. You know, Lord, what my sins are. I ask forgiveness, Lord. And Lord Jesus, I turn to you and recognize your sacrifice at the cross of Calvary. I surrender my life to you and recognize you as my Savior. And from this day on, I submit my whole life to you, 
help me to follow you. Be Lord of my life. Teach me how to obey you, Lord. And teach me how to understand your truth so that I may be able to follow. Thank you. I open my whole being to you right now. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you. This is my faith and my prayer. Amen. Amen. If you've done that prayer with me, then continue to know the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible. Have your own Bible and continue to read it. And if you can manage, continue to follow our video stream. For the rest of us, Let's bow down our heads for our closing prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the truth that you have taught us. We continue to submit our life to you, our heart, Lord, and our whole being, most especially with regards to all of what we have heard, what we have learned from your word. Father, give us grace now to be able to live these out, Lord. Help us to know contentment. Help us to be able to develop, Lord, and be developed in this virtue of contentment. So that, Lord, with confidence, with courage, we may continue to be all of what you have called us to be and designed us to be. Help us to be faithful and fruitful for your glory. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord continue to be your strength and wisdom as we continue in faith and in trust amidst the challenges of our day. May He bless you with everything you need in Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Great.